John. John was one of his apostles. Uh, even though the book of John isn't, uh, he doesn't say that he was written by John. We can tell from certain clues in the in the book that it was written by someone that knew Jesus, one of the one of the early apostles. So most likely, most likely it is written by John. So we're going to go to the ninth chapter of John. And we're going to read a little bit about a man born blind who receives his sight. So if you go to the ninth chapter of John, I'll start reading now. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Now, remember, Jesus talked in parables a lot. I don't think he was talking here about just, oh, the sun's going down. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go, wash in the pool of Solomon, which is translated sent. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors who, were who had previously seen he was, he was blind said, is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. So as we continue reading, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him. And he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received the sight. And they asked them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already, had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, they would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age ask him. So again, they called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know is though I was blind. Now I see. Then they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God speaks to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears them. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, 
you were completely born in sin and you were teaching us and they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking to you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come unto this world for those who do not see may see and the those who see may, may it may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. So I, I read this because a lot of people skip over this before they get to the next part. But these two parts interconnect. So if we move on to chapter 10, the first 11 verses of chapter 10, this is the very important part I want to talk about today. Most assuredly, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him and they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. Amen. That is the word of God. Today, we're going to talk about Jesus and how he's the door. So the message of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone in Jesus Christ, is a constant reminder of man's inability to save himself. It is a message that Jesus Christ alone is able to make atonement for our sins. It is a message that there is only one way of salvation. It is a reminder that there is a future judgment against sin for all who reject Christ as the only door to salvation. How you respond to Jesus Christ in this life determines where you will spend eternity. The Gospel of John describes a man born blind who came to a saving relationship with the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He not only received physical sight, but he received spiritual sight as well. As the light of the word, Jesus caused faith to sprout and grow in that man's life. But the spiritually blind religious leaders hated the Son of God. They tried to extinguish his light. The Pharisees excommunicated the man born blind. They kicked him out of the church, who was now healed from the whole order of life of the Jews. When Jesus heard what they had done to the man, Jesus asked him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The little man, who was now fighting for his life, responded, And who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. His response was, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. The blind man was confronted with Jesus Christ, and Christ became the deciding and turning point in the blind man's life. Often we hear about people who are suffering have no purpose in life, and they're confronted by Jesus, and they get the same thing that happens to them. That is their turning point. He believed and worshiped Christ, and from that moment, the man entered into eternal life. 
For that man, Christ was the doorway to eternal life. The critical question to be asked and answered today is what is your relationship with Jesus Christ? After the man worshiped Jesus, Christ said to those gathered around looking on, for judgment, I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. The self-righteous Pharisees rejected the light of the world. We could paraphrase Jesus' words to the Pharisees. You who claim to have spiritual sight apart from me may be demonstrated to the blind man that you really are. The blind leaders of the blind seized the moment and asked, we are not blind, are we? Jesus responded, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, your sin remains. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up by some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. These religious leaders claimed spiritual knowledge, yet they were completely blind. We see that often today. If you just, anywhere you look, you hear religious leaders that aren't true religious leaders. They claim to know, to see, but they're truly blind. <clears throat> they rejected the Son of God. They claimed to have sight, but acted like the blind. Their sin remained, and they were condemned for all eternity. <clears throat> it never occurred to these religious leaders that they could be spiritually blind. Jesus did not tell them they were spiritually blind, but they came to that power, con powerful conclusion and refused to act upon it, except in a hostile manner. I agree with many people that say there's no break between these two chapters. Jesus tells an allegory to illustrate the blindness of the Pharisees as false shepherds and of himself as both, both the door and the good shepherd. As the door, Jesus is the one and only entrance into salvation. As the good shepherd, he is the one who cares for the sheep and provides for the salvation at the cost of his life. He lays down his life for the sheep. On the other hand, the two figures bring out strong contrasts. When Jesus considers himself as the door, he brands those who do not use the door as thieves and robbers. When he thinks of himself as the good shepherd, he contrasts himself to the evil hiring shepherds. They are not interested in the welfare of the sheep, but the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So the essential thing in this parable is the good shepherd lays down his life voluntarily for the well-being of his sheep. Jesus has the power to lay it down and to take it up again. All throughout the Testament, you hear Jesus telling people what is going to happen. He talks about this in his parable here. He talks about, I am the good shepherd. I will die for my sheep. And we see this happen when he's nailed to the cross. Who are his sheep? It's us. He died for us. He died for our sins. The hostility of the Pharisees against the man born blind demonstrates that they were false shepherds. Jesus, on the other hand, is the good shepherd. Now, I don't know. I grew up in a farming community, and a lot of people where I grew up had sheep, goats, cattle, and you would have dogs. And you would whistle and make the dog do or herd the cattle out or the sheep out into the pasture. The dog knew the whistle to act. So if I wasn't known to that dog and I whistled, that dog wouldn't act. I would have been a false shepherd for that dog. The dog only listened to the good shepherd. That's what we need to do today is listen to the good shepherd. Shepherds are a powerful image in the Old Testament for leaders, both politically and spiritually. Here, Jesus distinguishes his own ministry from the false shepherds of Israel. A false shepherd of Israel 
failed to perform his divine responsibilities. However, the prophets looked forward to the divinely sent shepherd of God's own heart, who is like the shepherd David. Then I will set them over one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. Ezekiel 34, 23. John chapter 10 powerfully declares the fulfillment of this great Masonic prophecy. Jesus introduces himself as a shepherd, like unto David, Israel's true shepherd is the good shepherd. It is true the shepherd provides care for his flock, but he's also a powerful sovereign. He was an absolute ruler over his sheep. He determined their coming and going into the fold, where they would eat. He determined when they would be sheared, how they would be provided for, and even decided which ones would be sacrificed for the sin of the shepherd and his family. John chapter 10 sets forth Jesus as the true ruler and shepherd of his own people. Jesus is the ideal messianic ruler. He is the very opposite of the false shepherds. Here we see the nature and purpose of the good shepherd. He provides for a sheep, even to the extent of laying down his own life for them. He alone has the power to choose the manner of his own death. When he will die and when he will rise again from the dead, no one else has that kind of sovereignty. He is the rightful shepherd. Listen to this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door unto the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. That was in John 10, verses 1 and 2. For certain, for certain, literally, amen, amen, is always used in the gospel of John when Jesus is introducing a very important and powerful statement regarding our salvation. The word amen means to confirm. Therefore, it was used to give one's assent. It is the response of the congregation to a prayer, which just been uttered in the worship of the living God. Listen carefully, because Jesus is going to make a significant statement that relates to your eternal life. So if you go back and read John, when you hear, amen, amen, that's an important clue that something important is going to happen. It is a solemn, true, and significant statement. It always implies something regarding our knowledge of Christ. It is, in truth, the very truth. It is the most solemn truth that must be believed about Christ. Your response to that truth determines your eternal destiny. Jesus uses the expression, amen, amen, like prophets who declared, as I live, says the Lord. He speaks with all the authority of the kingdom of God. During the time of Christ, the sheep were herded into a walled enclosure with briars and long thorny vines growing on top, mostly open to the sky, but providing protection from thieves and wolves at night. The actual word Jesus uses means a courtyard. Thus a place where sheep are herded, a sheepfold. There was one door, and that was guarded by a doorkeeper. Jesus said, if a man does not enter by the door and climbs over the wall, he is up to no good. He is castinated as a thief and a robber. The word thief means to sneak thief using deception to get to the sheep. He steals cunningly or by stealth. Robber is one who is eager to engage in violence to plunder the sheep. He steals by violence. However, the good shepherd enters by the door because he has a right to enter through that door. He is recognized by the doorkeeper as a legitimate shepherd. Jesus pictures a large fold where several flocks find shelter. One doorkeeper can thus look after a large number of sheep composed of several flocks. 
The good shepherd goes in through the door as opposed to the thieves who climb over the walls to rob and destroy. It is his right to enter because he owns the sheep and he has come to claim them. The shepherd comes to call his sheep and they hear his voice and they follow him out to the pasture. Keep in mind, those who are gathered around listening to the allegory as Jesus tells it. Note the climax to the evil of the false shepherds. He is a thief and a robber. That is what the Pharisees were doing to the blind man in chapter 9. When the shepherd arrives in the morning, even before dawn, he calls out to his sheep, who hear his voice and respond only to his call. The Palestinian shepherd had an individual call for each of his sheep. Thus, the individual sheep know their shepherd's voice and recognize his call to each of his own. So remember, they're in a, a large courtyard, a sheepfold, and there's many flocks in there. So when the shepherd comes, he has a call that only his sheep recognize, and they come to him. <clears throat> they come to their shepherd, and he leads them out to the pasture. It is significant that the shepherd does not call sheep in general. He calls his own sheep with a distinct call that they recognize and respond to. Many travelers to Palestine have described sheep and their shepherds going to the sheep pens to get their flocks. The sheep were all mixed together in a common pen for the night. When the morning came, one of the shepherds stood some distance from the sheep and began to call his sheep. First one, then another, then four or five animals ran, ran towards him. In a few minutes, he had counted his whole flock and headed off to the luscious green fields with them. When all the sheep are together, the shepherd leads them out to their destination. The sheep hear his voice and follow their shepherd. They follow because they know their shepherd's voice. The man born blind heard the voice and responded to the call of his shepherd. Even while the Pharisees were climbing over the walls of religious activity, to steal, plunder, and destroy God's fold. Jesus presented himself to Judaism to call out a body that the Father had given to him. He will later call out sheep from other folds, that there might be one great flock. Jesus knows his sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He puts forth all his own. He goes ahead of them and the sheep follow. And because they know his voice, a stranger they simply will not follow. But they will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. The following verse informs us that the blind religious leaders listening to the allegory still do not understand the spiritual truth in this allegory. It is the great biblical truth that those who respond and follow Jesus will not lack any good thing that they need in a right relationship with Lord God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Not only does he provide us with all good things we need, but we will also dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We will enjoy eternal fellowship with him. Moreover, we are his people the sheep of his pasture, Psalms 100, verse 3. The Lord God tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He greatly leads those that have young, Isaiah 40, 11. No wonder we have no need. Our good shepherd is pictured walking before his sheep. He's always leading us into green pastures of spiritual refreshment. He knows where to take us, make us lie down and rest. He doesn't drive the sheep. He leads them. The sheep follow because they know the shepherd's voice. Why? They are accustomed to his voice. They are in the habit of following him. However, when a stranger appears on the scene and attempts to call the sheep out, they absolutely will not follow them. Jesus used a double negative in the Greek. When the stranger comes, 
whom they do not recognize, they flee for their lives. They do not now, they do not know the voice of the stranger and will not respond to his call. So I'm asking you this today, all gathered here. Have you heard his voice? Have you responded to his call? The Lord Jesus knows his sheep and they respond to him. Jesus calls his sheep by name. Jesus comes to the door of the sheepfold and knowing his sheep in advance, he calls them and leads them out. All those who are saved whom God has given Jesus. Let me tell you a little story uh, before I go on. Uh, you know, I had been in the military and I had been over in Iraq. I was in Iraq five times and it was very, very scary. I, my job was to go out and find the bombs on the side of the road that they would blow up and they would blow up the convoys of the vehicles of the soldiers. And I was petrified every day that something was going to happen to me. And one day I was alone in this garage where I was working on my vehicle that I had to take out into the field. And I just got down on my knees and I started talking to God and I heard his voice. God spoke to me. It was as clear as if someone was right there beside me. And he told me, do not be afraid. I'm with you. So I believe God talks to us. I, I think you just have to listen and you'll hear his voice. So Jesus saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed Jesus. We find that in Matthew 9, 9. Here was a lone sheep of Christ. A shepherd called him. He recognized his voice and he promptly followed him. Jesus looked up into a tree. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Luke 19, 5. Here was one of the sheep called by the name. The response was prompt, for we are told. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. Jesus found Philip, and Jesus said to him, Follow me. John 1, 43. This shows us the shepherd seeking his sheep before he called him. John 11 supplies us with a still more striking example of the drawing power of the shepherd's voice as he calls his own sheep. There we read of Lazarus in the grave. But when Christ calls his sheep by name, Lazarus, come forth, the sheep at once respond. Jesus said his sheep know his voice. Mary Magdalene was in the garden. She found the stone rolled away and the body of Jesus gone. Suddenly, as she stood there weeping in the cemetery, the risen Christ stands by her and said, she knew not that it was Jesus. He spoke to her, but he thought she, he, she thought he was the gardener. Then she identified him and said, Robani, Jesus said, stop clinging to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. No one believed her testimony that day until they saw Jesus themselves. The moment he called his sheep by name, she knew his voice. Grace, marvelous, beautiful, saving grace. God doesn't call us any differently today then he has always called sinners to himself. This is how he calls you. He knows you, and he knows you with all your failures and your sins. But he also knows what he's going to make of, of you through his saving grace. His goal is to make you like himself. Do you hear his calling? Have you responded to his voice? Your eternal destiny is determined by how you respond to his calling. Have you gone through that door? Remember, Jesus is the door. Christ changed the image slightly as he clarified his powerful message. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus compels his listeners to hear and respond. For certain, for certain, truly, truly. Amen, amen, beckons us to be quiet, be alert, listen with rapt attention to his words. Those who hear his voice and respond, follow him through the door into eternal life. 
I am the door of the sheep. Go back to the sheepfold imagery once again. The sheep are with their shepherd inside the stone enclosure during the night. There is no door of any kind in these enclosures. In place of the door, there was just an open space. At night, after the sheep, after the shepherd called in his sheep and herded them within the fold, and then the shepherd himself lay down across the opening and entrance to the sheepfold. The shepherd was the door. The sheep could not get out. No enemy could come in except over his body. In a very literal sense, the shepherd was the door. There was no way in or out except through him. Jesus is alone the door. He and he alone is and is always the door. For every true un unshepherd, Jesus is also the door to the sheep. For the sheep, Jesus is the door to all the blessing of eternal life. Jesus is saying, I and I alone, I and no other am the door of the sheep. Jesus is the one and only gate unto heaven. Jesus Christ is the sole way to God. There's no other way. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If there is no Christ, there's no way to God. If he's not the door, there is no entrance into God's presence. As the door, Jesus is the one way of entrance into salvation. As the good shepherd, he is the one who cares for the sheep and provides for the salvation at the cost of his own life. The image of the door conveys to the listener a certain exclusivity. There may be conceivably be more ways than one way of getting into a place. However, by the use of the door, Jesus has already made it clear that there is but one door. There is only one exit into eternal life. It is through Jesus Christ. Once you have entered through the door, it is impossible to be tolerant of the various false ways, which can lead only to eternal condemnation in hell. How can Jesus make such claims to be the only door to salvation and eternal life? What makes him so unique? How can he make such a statement of sovereign grace? I am. Jesus can make such remarkable claims because he is the I am. I am the door of the sheep. Everything he said makes good sense, since he is who he said he is, and he is who he claims to be. In this great, awesome statement, Jesus claims to be God. We deserve to die for our own sins, but the perfect Son of God was without sin. He was the holy and righteous God who came to save his people from their sins. He came and died as our substitute by means of his death for our sins and his resurrection. He literally became the door or gate by which sinful people can come into the presence of God. He is the new and living way, and it is through him we have access to the Father. There is only one door, and Christ himself is that door. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12. Your eternal destiny. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We read that through verses 8 through 11. The individual who puts his trust in Jesus is made alive spiritually. He receives life, a spiritual life, and begins the moment he puts his faith in Christ. That is a new life in Christ continues throughout eternity. 
I think you felt this if you became born again. It definitely was a, a different feeling before you accepted Christ and was born again and then after. It is the kind of life Jesus has. It is a contained life, a life of peace with God, knowing all your sins have been forgiven, and security that you will be with God all your life, even when you die physically. Remember, God has a large mansion. He has many rooms. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. A second time Jesus said he is the door by me or through me are in the emphatic position in the original. It is Jesus Christ and no other who enables men to enter salvation. There's a certain exclusiveness about the door. The politically correct world does not like the words of Jesus. If there is one door, then men must enter it or stay outside. They cannot demand another door. He makes it clear that salvation was the purpose of Jesus' coming. Salvation is the comprehensive term for the whole process, thereby men are delivered from the consequences of their sins and brought into an eternal self saving relationship with God. John uses the term saved much the same way he does for a person living eternal life. Moreover, it is a life that is filled with the confidence that your shepherd is equal to every emergency and supplies all your genuine needs according to the riches and glory in Jesus Christ. Such peace only comes through the hands of the Good Shepherd. Abundant life today. The abundant life Jesus gives us is one that overflows. I came that they may have, that they may keep on having life and may keep on having it abundantly. The word abundant means to have a surplus, a superabundance, till it overflows. It's a Greek word, and it means, it's a mathematical word, and it, and it means a surplus. Jesus had a surplus of leftovers after he fed 5,000. These 12 baskets of leftovers were in abundance. Our shepherd always gives in abundance. The English word abundance comes from a Latin meaning, the rise in waves or to overflow. It is a picture of unceasing rise of waves upon a seashore with waves rising again and again in the incoming tide. It is also a picture of increasing abundance, like that which causes the river to overflow its banks as a result of increasing rains. The life Jesus offers us for each day is a life that overflows from a supply of confidence that God is equal to every emergency and does supply all our genuine needs according to his riches in the glory of Christ Jesus. The abundant life is the life of the sheep who finds themselves in the hands of the good shepherd. The good shepherd's banks are always overflowing with waters of abundance. His grace is always more than enough for all our needs. Nothing can suppress the unending of all sufficiency of his provision for his sheep. Such is the good we serve. Such is the God we serve. I'm sorry. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in the glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19. Before we know, before we can know a life of abundance, we must know a life itself as it comes to us in Christ. We must first be made alive through the faith in Christ. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life. That life is found by going through the door. Christ is the door to eternal life. Only after we go through the door and receive his life can we have his kind of life in abundance. Are you aware that you have this life in Christ? How do you live the abundant life the shepherd gives us all who go through his door? We reckon upon the grand provisions that Christ himself he leads us into the fullness of his new life in Christ. He always gives his very best, and he gives it in abundance. 
It is a walk of faith. He leads us in and out to find good pasture. His sheep are well fed and provided with all good things. Now and will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The sheep who followed the good shepherd will not lack any good thing. The awesome truth of Christianity is that Jesus Christ, crucified, declares that man is incapable of saving himself. It declares the supremacy that Jesus alone is able to make the atonement for our sins. And because of that fact, he is the only way to salvation. Because of personal sin and failure to live up to God's expectations of man, every person will face a future judgment against sin. Those who have come through the door of Jesus Christ to eternal life will be saved for all eternity and enjoy fellowship with him. To all who reject him, it is the eternal separation from God in a place called hell. So here's some abiding principles and practical applications. The cross of Christ is the turning point in your life, and what you do at that point determines where you spend eternity. Will you pass through the door into eternal life? Those who believe on Jesus Christ enter the eternal life and enjoy God's presence for all eternity. Those who reject him and refuse to pass through his door go into eternal separation from him forever in hell. Your response to Jesus Christ as the door determines your eternal destiny. Will you walk through the door by faith today and receive his gift of eternal life? The Lord Jesus Christ knows his sheep and they follow him. Jesus says that he knows his sheep because they have been given to him by the Father. But he not only knows us individually, he knows all about us. He knows that we are sinners and went ahead and died for us on the cross. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Nothing in his flock is hidden from him. Their weaknesses, their failures, their temptations, their sins, the good which they have neglected when it was within the reach, the evil which they have pursued when it would lay afar, all is open before his eyes. He knows them and he loves them still. The good shepherd died for his sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. The shepherd provides atonement for his sheep. He died on behalf or instead of the sinners. So you have to remember there's only one door. There are not many ways to God. There is only one door. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. And he will go in and out and find pasture. To enter through the door is the same as to eat Jesus, drink Jesus, or to come to Jesus. You must believe on Christ or trust in him personally to be saved. We are not trusting in things to be saved. The door is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He becomes ours through believing in him. The only thing necessary is to believe or trust in Jesus Christ. Have you believed or trusted in him for everlasting life? It helps us to imagine that the cross has a door in it. Jesus invites us to go through it. Above the door is written the great invitation to all. Whoever will may come. Every sinner stands there before the door. When you enter in by faith, you discover that all of your sins are forgiven and you are safe within his fold. Rejoicing with all the saints in heaven, you will then turn around and see written on the backside of the cross those wonderful words of grace. Chosen in him before the foundations of the world, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor. May you enter the door right now. The blind man 
had the blind, the man born blind had nothing. He was a beggar. He was, he was noting people pushed him out of the synagogue. But this is the very man Jesus called, and he heard his voice and responded. The man whom everyone despised was the man Jesus saved. He passed through the door to eternal life. There is no greater security than this, because the sheep are in the care of the good shepherd. Amen. That is my message. I just hope everyone understands what I said today. There's only one way to get there, and that's to go through that door, and that door is Jesus Christ. So I'm going to hand it back to uh, Sister Chimmy.